evening. Good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Brett with an impromptu kingdom release. Blessings to your evening. Blessings to your evening. Uh, if you come on, um, and blessings to those that will watch this by YouTube. Uh, impromptu, good evening. I'm, I'm assuming that's Brian. Blessings to you this evening. Thank you, Father. Come on, just say hello. Uh, thank you, Father. Let me see. Um, excuse me a moment. God bless you. Hi. Well, blessings to both of you. Blessings to both of you. Blessings to both of you. Hey, bestie. Amen. Amen. Good evening, Danielle. Good evening. Let me see. Get some things together. Get some things together. To, well, I won't say the last minute, but the Lord's minute. Um, I don't want too much of that light on my face. Come and just say hello. Greet each other. Amen. Good evening, Nicole. Excuse me. Good evening. Good evening. Blessings. Good evening, Mr. Steele. This is a impromptu meeting um, and sitting of the Lord. Um, he told me earlier today, just had some other things to do, but um, blessings to you all that are that are here on and those that will be on later um, that will view later or be on later blessings blessings to you all um i want to want to start with prayer thank you father thank you holy spirit minister Robert. thank you jesus thank you father thank you father thank you lord thank you lord thank you lord ah thank you lord thank you lord Thank you, Lord. This will be a good time to get uh, notepad, Bible, um, some things in the heart of the Father that he wants me to share with you all as we prepare in a few days for another year. Um, for 2022, blessings to you in Ireland, Audrey. Blessings to you this evening. Thank you, 
Father. This one is, I want to I sit a moment. It's good to wait on the presence of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Ah, baby, 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 so Korean Damasi. Baby, Koshia, Tabakasi, Korean Damasi, Korea, Takai. Ambre, say the big Koshia, Tabakai. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for releasing your angels, O oh God. Recalibrating this moment, O oh Lord. Recalibrating the airways across the earth. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. angels being dispatched around this world's globe. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 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 Rest on our homes, O oh God, on our lives, O oh God, on our children's lives, on our posterity, O oh God. Lord, let your sovereignty and your authority visit every Senate, every Parliament, every leadership convening on this earth and align according to your kingdom purposes. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Release it. Thank you for releasing it. Thank you for releasing it. Thank you for releasing it, oh God. Thank you, Lord. And for your apostles, oh God, strengthen, strengthen their arms, strengthen their soldiers, strengthen their shoulders, their minds, their movements, oh God. Give them the disciples that they need in this hour, oh God. Jehovah Rofika, thank you that you are the Lord who heals spirit, soul, and body. And body. There is no name that is above the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we decree and declare that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is exalted above every name. Every name that man has set into the atmosphere Every consequence that man has set into the atmosphere, we decree and declare and speak to the atmospheres that the authority of the Lord Jesus is exalted above it all. 
It's exalted above Omicron. It's exalted above COVID-19. It's exalted above dementia. It's exalted above mental instability, psycho, any kind of psycho uh, illnesses, schizophrenia. I call back forth the minds of humanity that the blinders may be relieved, released from their minds in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, establish the minds of your people in this hour, oh God. The right hemisphere, the left hemisphere, fear, the forebrain, the hinder brain, Father, in the name of Jesus. Blow your Eurocliden winds, Lord God, even over the minds as you place a moratorium over the works of the enemy and the kingdom of darkness in this hour in the name of Jesus. Let the kingdoms of men be resubmitted to the lordship of the Christ, the Lord Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Je me send your fire, your terror upon the works of evil and wickedness and frustrate every ungodly and wicked and evil agenda set forth in this earth, Lord God, to distract, delay, detour your people. This is the time of your kingdom, O oh God. This is the time of your kingdom. And we decree and declare in our atmospheres, in Europe, in North America, Father God, in Canada, in Africa, we decree and declare in Australia, Lord God, in Israel, Lord God, in the Middle East, oh God, in Asia and South Asia, Antarctica, Lord God, that your kingdom is exalted above all. All 206 countries and seven continents, let the angels carry your voice, oh God, and your Lord God, pre the preordained Lord God in divine orchestrations, let them be realigned as you recalibrate the airways in the name of Jesus. Send a release, O God, from heaven. Send a release, O God, from heaven. Let your fear, O God, be felt. Let your fear, O God, your fear, the fear of your sovereignty, of your holiness and righteousness, Lord God. But also your love. To the lost of humanity. Let it spread across, across this globe in this hour, oh God. This is your time. This is your hour. I make that decree and declaration in this hour. This is your time and your hour. Shake our minds, Lord God, and our souls loose from slumber and apathy. Send your release, O God. Send your release, O God. Let our children feel it. Let our grandchildren feel it, O God. Let them feel the shaking of the conviction of the Holy Ghost. Silence, O oh God, every lying tongue. Put a hook, Lord God, in the jaw of the enemy, Lord God. Till his language is confused. I speak a reversal and the blessings of God and a reversal upon every satanic curse that's been prayed on mountaintops in this region, in this valley of the Antelope Valley in Southern California, in the name of Jesus. I decree and declare that the blessings that are due the Antelope Valley in California come now, come now, come now. His shakings come now in the name of Jesus. Come now in the name of Jesus. Come now in the name of Jesus. Frustrate the works of the enemy, O oh God. Frustrate the works of the enemy, O oh God. As you put in the mouth of your intercessors and prophetic intercessors the vetoes 
and righteous legislation that is due in this hour. And across this nation, the Northeast, Tampa and abroad, Dunkirk, Maryland and abroad, Long Island, New York, Romulus, Michigan, Phoenix, Arizona. Yes, God. Yes, God. Come on. Come Strengthen your apostles, oh God. Strengthen your apostles in this hour. Strengthen your apostles in this hour, oh God. Orlando, Florida. Set in order. Set it in order. Set it in order. Set it in order. Set it in order. Kebekosia tabakai. Aya namase korianda basia tabasia. My God, my God, my God. Ah, kebekosia tabakai. Kebekosia. E namase umbekosia tabakai. Move through the Lone Star State. Memphis, Tennessee. Be realigned. Memphis, Tennessee. Be realigned. Oh, yes, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for renewed minds, O oh God. Thank you for renewed minds, O oh God. Thank you for renewed minds, O oh God. Lord, and the wealth, the return of wealth that's due your continent of Africa. The wealth that's been stolen age after age and generation after generation from that land of wealth, from people to resources, from people to resources. Return to your people that Africa may rebuild. Give them your mind and your templates and your systems. Give them kingdom. Like never before, like never before, like never before. Make a return. I hear the Lord bringing a return of wealth to the inhabitants of inhabitants of Africa. And Africa come forth in America. Africa come forth in the United States of America. The wealth that was stolen, that was sold and brought to this nation. I speak and decree and declare a restoration. For those of us, O oh God, whose forefathers you sent and allowed to come to the borders of this nation, give us our due, O oh God. Give us our due in wisdom, in structure, in infrastructure, in legislation. Kinamayoso no boko shiam dabasi, kidiri de bishiom 
Ah, I hear the Lord say, and I'm restoring it. I hear the Lord say, and I am restoring it. Restore, O God, that which was lost, stolen, and destroyed. Revive and renew in the posterity. Legislate it. Legislate it. I call forth the needed legislations for every restoration, vindication, and compensation. Lord, send forth your spiritual Cyrus to rebuild your walls and bring revival to this nation and to the nations that require it, O oh God. Where things, those things have been lost and stolen. Ah! Yes! Thank you, Lord Jesus. The Lord is moving his movements beyond just our front doors. The Lord is moving and causing his movements to be bigger than just our front doors. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Alebe shomo kori anda basi. Kimbre ke debe kosi anda basi kija. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. This is a this is good good evening to everyone and good morning to those that are in other continents, Europe that may be watching, and even those that whatever if you're watching now, blessings to you. There's some clarity that the Lord wants me to bring that um, he said, I, I want you to, to, to help my people to be ready for 2022, um, help bring some understanding to some things that are misunderstood. And so I'm going to share some kingdom revelation. Everything I share is kingdom, but I want to share some kingdom revelation because the Father wants you to be helped. He wants you to be strengthened by truth. Okay? You can't receive strength unless it's through the truth. Um, the law was given by Moses, but when the law was given it was given to a people who were without strength or grace to do the truth so they had to love God with all their heart soul mind and strength in order to do the truth well when Jesus came the Bible says he came full of grace and truth so the Lord does not reveal truth without accompanying that truth with grace. Okay? So the Lord will give you the grace, the supernatural ability to do the truth. Okay? To do the truth. Um, I want to look at 
John chapter 3. And um, blessings to you, blessings to you all that are that are watching and those again that will watch by um, YouTube. Uh, blessings to you. Um, Miss Sandra D. Genova, blessings to you. Shalom, I like him. Miss Jerry. Thank you, Father. I want to look at a familiar scripture in John 3 and Blessings, uh, Kimberlyn Livingston. Blessings to you. Um, hello, Patricia Main from the North Gate. This is, it's Wednesday. This is a Wednesday. And this is usually a time when I am in private conference with those disciples that I meet at this time. And the Lord let me know earlier today that he wanted, he said, um, he wanted me to use this time to meet with, um, to sit on this platform, okay, so um, for those that are here. So what the Lord uh, has to say on this evening is not just for those that I usually meet with in private conference on the, at this time on, on Wednesdays. The Lord said, no, this is, the Lord reminds me every once in a while. He said, do like I did. There are times when I went amongst the multitudes and released uh, revelation of the kingdom. And that is because that the Lord wants, um, the Lord wants is still making a clarion call for disciples for the kingdom. Um, the Lord has let me know that um, I've been meeting privately with four groups of kingdom disciples of different generations, but four groups of kingdom disciples for over the past year. And the Lord said, but even though he, he the Lord was letting me know that there are those um, through social media who have become disciples of, of the of the kingdom they may not sit at your feet per se but they have heard truths that were released and chosen to submit to me meaning to God that I might lead them more succinctly and with greater clarity in their lives so this is the reason why the father has ordained for me to be here on this evening because this is not just for those that have this is not just for the 12 as it were even though there's more than 12 that I meet with privately but this is not just for the 12 this is for anyone who in their heart has chosen to be a disciple amen so um and the lord the lord knows the father speaks to me uh, of you of you all all the time and those that are that are listening and that are taking heed and hearing and the Lord makes it clear to me he he makes it clear they're getting it they're getting it they're getting it they're getting it and one of the things that the Lord has said recently is there are and have been a remnant who have been posturing themselves and praying that the will of the Lord be done. And the Lord wants you to know, whether you're sitting presently now or you will hear at a later time, he wants you to know he's heard you. There are things that the Lord in his sovereignty, he must do first. Okay, there are things that the Lord must do first. Okay before we see certain manifestations. Um, the last time I, I well, what, what was it, a couple of days ago, um, when I gave a release 
um, of the live, I don't know when it was, honestly, but the, I don't know if it was a couple days ago or I don't know, but the last time that I gave a release, I mentioned um, Noah and that God could not bring the rain until Noah had finished with the ark. There could not be a demonstration of righteousness. There could not be judgment for what was wicked until there was a demonstration of righteousness. And there are those of us who have humbled ourselves in prayer, have humbled ourselves in posture, and it has given the Lord permission in, 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 the, up, in the year coming to begin to touch some things and hit some things and realign some things that need to be realigned. All, all, all the Lord needs is a remnant. He doesn't need uh, um, everybody. He needs a remnant. He needs a core of those that set themselves apart that his righteousness might be revealed. In the, in, the, in the case with Noah, I mentioned in the last live, there were only eight, unfortunately. There were only eight individuals. Nevertheless, they were a remnant. And once the remnant had finished their alignments in obedience, the judgment came. Y'all follow me. So there cannot be a judgment of iniquity and wickedness until there is an alignment of those who are righteous. Okay? So, the Lord is saying that there's some things that he is going to visit in 2022 because of the alignment of the remnant. Because of the posture of true humility of the remnant of those who have cried out for the earth, for their nation, for their continent. Um, Lord, in essence, don't leave us like this. Don't leave us to the hand of the enemy. And this is part of the reason why there is an appearance, as it were, of such an upheaval of wicked and unrighteousness because the enemy knows that God is coming to deal. So what Satan wants to do when he assigns his demons to do is to keep atmospheres clouded with his mindsets, with confusion and with fears, okay? Not talking about inconveniences. I'm talking about to keep atmospheres overwhelmed with his mindsets, with fears, with confusions, with hatred, so that even the remnant are distracted because in whatever you look at constantly becomes your strength, even if it's fear. Even if it's fear. Whatever you look at on a consistent basis becomes your strength. Okay? So that's our choice of what we look at of what we peer at, of what we meditate on, because whatever that is becomes your strength. Okay? And God is ready to handle some things. And we're crossing over into 2022 in just a few days. And even though we're in going into the fifth month, number five, of God's new year, 5782, there are certain things that God has been waiting for humanity to be in expectation of a transition, hence 2022. And so the Lord says, okay, you've been waiting for the new year? Okay. So I will say this before I get into the scriptures, I will say this that your movement with the Holy Spirit and obedience to the Holy Spirit in the smallest of things is going to determine how you'll be able to keep up with him, okay? That's going to determine how you'll be able to keep up with God. Some of us are going to need some OJT, 
of walking in the spirit. You're going to have to, the Lord, the windows of obedience are, go, are getting smaller and smaller. They're getting smaller and smaller. So the Holy Spirit can convict you today on a Wednesday. And the Holy Spirit can convict you today on a Wednesday. And then by Friday, the grace and the conviction be removed because the Lord was looking for you to decide on Wednesday or by Thursday morning or by Thursday afternoon. If it's a Thursday morning, depending on where you are in the world, okay? The windows of obedience are getting smaller, okay? So today with the, the, the wisdom and the revelation that God has called me to, to and, and commanded me, and I don't mind saying that, we have a problem with that word, not just told me, not put upon my heart, <laughs> you know, he commanded me, <laughs> sit and release, use the time that you would normally meet with the disciples and meet openly and tell my people that I'm looking, that I only give son, only give dominion to sons. I only give dominion to sons. I don't give dominion to anointed people. I only give dominion to sons. Okay. So I'm going to follow the Holy Spirit. I don't have anything written down. I just I'm just going to follow him. Okay? So the first scripture that I'm going to look at is the the, the infamous John 3 16 and as we look at the scriptures I'll be re um, conveying what the scripture means so not just giving the scripture but saying what the Lord wants to make sure that we understand that the scripture means John 3 16 I'm reading King James for God so loved the world, the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. And I don't want to get into that part, but, but in Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, Jesus was speaking years in advance the sacrifice that he would be obedient in giving, which would be his physical life. Okay? This Jewish son raised by Joseph and Mary who had Jesus himself having about seven brothers and sisters because Mary and Joseph had children after Jesus was born, okay, of which two of Jesus' natural brothers were Jude, which is the book before Revelations, and James, which is the book after Hebrews. Those were Jesus' brothers. They were Mary's sons. They were Mary and Joseph's sons. Okay. They were Joseph and Mary's sons, Jude and James. Whatever you all need to do, um, this will be as it is now on YouTube. Um, and I say now because I'm speaking towards the future. So however you choose to to watch the Lord's blessings to you. Me being here is not about views. It's about releasing the word into atmospheres and regions. And the Holy Spirit and the Father, the Heavenly Father and his angels will be released to make sure, decreeing and declare that, that those who need to hear 
will be able to hear. Because this is what God is saying. God gives dominion, only gives dominion to sons. He does not give dominion to servants. Okay? He does not give dominion to servants. He gives dominion to sons. God, in verse 16 of, of John chapter 3, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, in the son, who the father would give and has given would have everlasting life. What that scripture means is not whoever says the sinner's prayer gets saved. If you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, was buried three days and three nights, and rose from the grave, and you confess him as your Lord and Savior, you get saved. You don't get saved like that. I mean, I mean even help with that. Okay? Jesus said in John chapter 6, he said, in John chapter 6, Jesus said, No man can come unto me, Except the Father which sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So no one can even if a person if the Holy Spirit has not drawn a soul to say, I need the Savior, and they in response to the drawing of the Holy Spirit, to the drawing of the Holy Spirit which may come through evangelism, which may come through a message given in a service, which may come through word of God that is released on the airwaves. But if the Holy Spirit himself does not draw an individual by conviction of, the, of righteousness that you need a new nature, your life, is going to remain empty without the Lord Jesus, without Jesus. And you need to, even if you don't know it's Jesus and you're somewhere, you're somewhere in a, in a nation that doesn't even have Bibles. The Holy Spirit, on the day of Pentecost, over 2,000 years ago, was released into this earth. And because of the obedience of the apostles, it gave God permission to send the Holy Spirit throughout the earth. So you have those who have even been led by the Holy Spirit and they didn't even know it was the Holy Spirit. They just said, I don't know who it is. It's a supreme being and he told me to do this and I did it. They don't necessarily have to know it was Jesus. But their alignment with God and with heaven makes it righteous. Especially in Western civilization. Because I can't speak for any other nation. We have isolated and made believing in Jesus about Christianity. The religion. Blessings, Miss Brooks. We have made it about Christianity in itself, quote unquote. And it's about the Heavenly Father who so loved the world who gave his son. He gave a son. He gave a son. And as a result of that son's obedience, that son, look at Matthew 28, was given all authority both in heaven and in earth because he accomplished his purpose as a son when God sent Moses in Exodus 3 to Egypt he told Moses to tell Pharaoh Israel is my son even my firstborn and I say unto you, let my son go that he may worship me. And if you will not let my son go, I will slay your firstborn. God said that before Moses left Mount Sinai. Because God met Moses on Mount Sinai. 
by himself before he sent him and his brother back to Egypt to meet with the elders and then eventually to meet with Pharaoh, etc. And then the showdown began. God said, Israel is my son. And God intended to give the son who would become a nation. Dominion in Canaan. This is the kingdom principle. So I'm speaking to those of us who seek after all the imagery of what we call Christianity in the 21st century. Of what we think Christianity is and what we think authority is. God only gives dominion to sons. When Jesus said what he said to Nicodemus, what John 3.16 means is this. John 3.16 means whoever, I'm going to break it down to the, to the root. Jesus did not tell his disciples, the apostles, to go convert people. Jesus told his disciples, the apostles, to make disciples. To make disciples. The apostles were sons. The apostles were sons. And so when Jesus told the apostles to go throughout all the earth and make disciples, teaching them whatsoever, he said, I have commanded you. So each apostle had the grace and responsibility to only teach what they learned from Jesus. So I don't try to teach what anybody else is teaching. I don't try to convey what I have not proven in my life. And Jesus sent the apostles to multiply disciples so that those who would come become disciples would choose whether or not they wanted to be saved, whether or not they wanted to be converted. So in the world today, we have had it backwards for however many thousands of years, for a thousand years or so, we've had it backwards because we tried to get people converted who have no spiritual discipline. And once they get converted, they're clueless as to, so what do I do now? So we have many people who have been converted. Okay? Okay. We have people who have been converted, but they don't know how to live kingdom. They don't know what it means to be saved. They have no idea. And so we seek, we've sought for positioning in the world and in the church so that really because we lack affirmations elsewhere, so that we can feel important about doing the will of God. Jesus was saying in John 3, 16, that God gave his son with the intention of his son, which he did, making disciples. Because the disciples, John 7 and John 19, I believe it is, the disciples were only disciples. They were not converted. The disciples did not have the Holy Spirit indwelling in them. They did not. Jesus was the only one in the earth full of the Holy Spirit. No one else had the Holy Spirit but Jesus. So when Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus, he was saying it with the inference that whoever chooses to be discipled by those who will follow me when I leave, in essence, and choose to continually believe in me, continually, continually, then I will exchange 
eventually they will come to a place of conversion and I will exchange death for life. In other words, I will give them life in every area, spiritually, physically, and solically, where they continue to cling to, trust in, and rely on me. So anyone, and I've done it before. When I was in my consecration, there was one in particular that became a disciple and others who became a disciple and gave their life later after I left the state of Georgia. There were those who the Lord had me to disciple without having a Bible study. I'm going to say that again. There are those that the Lord led me to disciple without having a Bible study. They watched how I handled inconveniences. They watched my prayer life. They watched how I responded to occurrences in the world differently than everybody else. And they said, what is that? My new nature. It's because of the intimate relationship that I have with God by the Holy Spirit that I know what I need. I already know that the Heavenly Father knows what I have need of. So I don't focus on what I need. I focus on what he's saying. I focus on how he's moving. There were those who I resided with when I was doing property management who would know that I had barely any food in the cupboard. And in one day, they would watch me come home with a month's worth of groceries from the marketplace while I walked everywhere that I went. How did you get all this, Brett? I went to Walmart. I followed the Lord. I went to Walmart when he told me to go to Walmart. And I walked a mile. I went to stand in the line. And when I went to stand in one line, the Lord told me to switch and go into another line. When I went into the other line, there was a very ornery and, and, and mean cashier. But she didn't disturb my peace. And she was talking very mean, like she should have stayed home. And there was a gentleman behind me, an older gentleman, who had just got off work. And he witnessed how I responded to this woman. And he rebuked her for my sake. And he said, what's your problem? Why are you talking to her like that? I said, sir, it's okay. I don't have to take this home with me. My peace is intact. This man, his name was Gene, followed me across the parking lot and offered to give me a ride home. I said, no, sir, no, thank you. It's a beautiful day. I'm going to walk. He said, but I feel like I'm supposed to get something from you. And I said, well, I'm not sure what that is because the Holy Spirit hadn't spoken to me. Two weeks later, I leave my dwelling place again at the time that the Lord said. And the same man that stood behind me in Walmart was driving down a road at its speed limit of 50 miles per hour and saw me walking and immediately pulled over and got out of his truck on the other side of the meeting, median and yelled my name out. He said, oh my God, I knew I was supposed to see you again. Long to the short, after we sat at a park and I imparted just wisdom to him, I never told him I was a Christian. I never told him that I was a Christian. And he asked me question after question after question. To which I answered. And he said, how do you do it? He told me he was a Christian that needed to get back with his relationship with God. And from that sitting of four hours, it wound up being four hours, he took me in his beautiful Dodge Durango and took me grocery shopping for everything that I would need for a month. Because of what I gave out of my spirit in the moment of discipling, and I never told him that I was a Christian. Never told him. And during this time, 
I was living off of $10 a week. I had relinquished everything to walk this Bible. And this man bought me a month worth of groceries and said, thank you so much. He was an older gentleman. Now, if I was of the world mindset, and somebody following you across the parking lot and etc. Like, without the Holy Spirit is like, okay, what's this guy want? Is he looking for somebody that he could be a sugar daddy to? My mind could have went in many ways. But the peace of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit, I heard God say, get in the truck. And the Lord chose through Mr. Gene. The Lord provided for me through this man. When Jesus said to Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him continually shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That means when you hear the good news, there's a conviction and a drawing by the Holy Spirit. You choose to accept that drawing. Because I'm not saying you can't give your life to Christ unless you've been discipled. But I am saying that you cannot receive an inheritance without discipleship. Without a renewing of the mind and the Holy Spirit directly or indirectly through someone else. Showing you what it means to walk according to the new nature that you receive. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you don't know what you're doing. And most of it, what we wind up doing is we wind up patterning our lives after falsities of how God has been presented. And so now in these days, God has been getting a bad rap, as it were because he's been misrepresented. So my responsibility in calling for and making disciples is to make sure that people and God's people, even if it requires revisiting, understand what God meant and what Jesus meant. Amen. Amen for the renewing of the mind. Amen for the renewing of the mind. You can't have a renewing. A renewing of the mind is as, I love the example of a caterpillar to a butterfly. That's a renewal. That's a, meta, that's a metamorphosis to where you are. It's a rebuilding. It's a metamorphosis to where you don't go back to what you used to be. And your total appearance first spiritually is transformed into something else that you never were and everyone has a metamorphosis ordained by God Jesus was saying to Nicodemus Jesus was saying to Nicodemus you can't understand what I'm saying sir leader O leader of Israel unless you have been born from above and so by the time he gets to John 3 16 he's saying look the father God so loved the world that he gave his only son which makes God a father okay it's the inference and implication that God is a father and love gives. I want to look at Luke. So John 3.16 is not, if you say this in his prayer, then you get saved. You don't get saved because you say this in his prayer alone. You get saved because what you confess and what you and asking for salvation is the result of the Holy Spirit drawing you. 
It's not just because, you know what, I think I need to change in my life. I'm going to give my life to God. If the Holy, if God the Father has not sent the Holy Spirit to draw you by conviction, you're saying words. And I'm not going to say what happens or doesn't happen because honestly, I'm going to tell you, I don't know. But I will say this. The Lord knows. The candle, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching the inward parts. And when that happens, when that moment happens, the Lord knows whether or not someone meant it or not. There is an exchange that takes place in the spirit. But I will say there is a scripture where Jesus said, in vain do they worship me. And then he goes on to say, you draw nigh to me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. So I've seen, I've seen it and I've seen people, I've seen young people. When I did prison ministry, I would see the young people and especially the young men that were in the prison and I would make an altar call and most of them would come forth because they wanted to see if they could smell me or whatever their reasons were, <laughs> right? And they would say, yeah, you know, I think I want that, Miss G. I think I'm ready to give my life to God. And the Lord would let me know, no, they're not. And there were times, and that was back in the 90s. There were times when I would say, no, you're not. How are you going to tell me I'm not ready to give my life to the Lord? Because the Lord just told me you're not, so stay in that seat. Because the Lord just let me know he's not drawing you. Now, keep on coming to Sunday service. When I come to the prison and the Lord will let me know when you're ready. But the Lord just told me you got an ulterior motive for coming up here. And there were things that the Lord will call out and said, no, you made a, you made a bet with some of your fellow inmates before you came to the service today on how you could try to run some rap or whatever or Miss G when she came. So I'm going to tell you right now, whoever your friends that you told that watch, watch, I'm going to get her to pray for me and I'm going to get her to da 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 I was like, you got the wrong one. You got the wrong one. And so stay right there. There were times when I told them, stay right there in that seat because you ain't ready. How you know that? Because the Holy Spirit that you will receive one day when you do get saved just told me. You ain't ready, so stay right there in that seat. And I would tell the 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 officer that escorted the young man into the service. I said, I said, yeah. I said, from now on, I'm not stopping anybody. I don't have a right to stop anybody from coming to the Sunday Protestant service. I said, but I'm letting you know. I'm keeping an eye on this one. I said, and I'm gonna know. And they would just laugh and say, man, she got you cold. Because I heard you having that conversation in the, in the dorm or in the room. I heard you having that conversation. She got you, man. You busted. And he would walk back embarrassed because as much as he might have tried to convince me verbally that he was ready, God hadn't prepared him. So I know by experience. I don't know about every person. But I know by experience and by the scriptures. Jesus said it in John 6. No man can come into me except the Father which sent me draw him. I want to look at Jesus. We know that Jesus was born and of Mary, conceived by the Holy Ghost, by the Word. But I want to look at uh, Luke chapter 2. Well, look at Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Luke chapter 2, I'm going to start reading at verse 41. It says, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. Okay? And that was, that was key in saying that because, thank you, Apostle Ron. That was key in saying that, that his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover because 
the men had to appear, but the, for the women, it was optional. Okay. For the women, it was optional. That would, that was, that was God had commanded three times a year. The men would appear to him and pass over. And that sacred year was the beginning of that. So it's saying that Joseph and Mary, that Mary also went, um, to, to Jerusalem from their neighborhood. They were traveling, do their pilgrimage for the Passover. Verse 40, 42, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus, the child, not the Messiah, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. Verse 44. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they saw him among their kinsfolks and acquaintance. And that was because they traveled in caravans, and the children were usually in the in the in the in the certain section of the caravan. So you didn't have all the families like we would get in a family and all get in a vehicle. They didn't travel like that. You had the men in part of a caravan, the women in part of the caravan, and the children in part of the caravan. So that's why it took them a day to realize he was gone. Okay. Verse 45. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them, not teaching, both hearing them and asking them questions. So by now, Jesus has already had his bar mitzvah. He has been graduated into manhood, as was the Jewish custom, by being 12, having his, what was a bar mitzvah, or the graduation into manhood, to be able to listen to and comment um, and ask questions on the scriptures. Okay, y'all following me? So, Jesus is 12. They went to the Passover this particular year when he's 12. So what this says with him being back at the temple, that in his mind as a child, he's like, well, I'm a man now. And it's time for me to study the scriptures. Okay. Be making a parallel. Verse 47, and all that heard him, meaning Jesus, were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Jesus responds in verse 49, and he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not, or did you not know that I must be about my father's business? So what this says is that Jesus at 12 knew that God was his father. Okay. So Jesus is born. He's not, when he's born, he's not the Messiah. I'm going to make this clear. When Jesus was born, he was not yet the Messiah. He was the Son of God. Okay? What does Messiah mean? It means Christos. It means anointed one. Jesus was not born anointed. So let me, because I'm, I'm breaking this down real simple for everybody that will watch it, and that is watching, and that will re will rewatch it. When you get saved, you are not anointed. I don't care how gifted you are. They just got saved and they got an anointing on their lives. When I hear them sing, I just feel the presence of God and I feel the presence of God. And I mean, and I just started crying, they're anointed. No, they're not. No more than Jesus was. Jesus wasn't even anointed at 12. He was the son of God. So he responded to Joseph and Mary, why is it that you sought me? 
Why is it that you sought me? In other words, why were you looking for me? I just had my bar mitzvah. I've entered into manhood, and now it's time for me to get ready to be the Messiah. Not yet, Jesus. Not yet. I would say not yet. I hear the name Marcus. Not yet, Marcus. Not yet, I see the name Penelope. Not yet, Penelope. Not yet, Marcia. Not yet, Susan. You may be gifted. You may be saved. But you have not yet completed the process to be anointed. Neither did Jesus. So what did he do? And they understood in verse 50. Not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth. He went back to the hood. Just like David, though he was anointed to be the king, it wasn't time for him to learn kingship. He defeats Goliath and he goes home. He defeated a principality. And he goes right back home to the sheep. Verse 50, and they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. That scripture reference, reference about David is 1 Samuel 17, by the way. Verse 51, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them, sonship. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Last verse of chapter 2, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and man. He increased, which means the level of his wisdom, the level of his stature, the level, level of his favor had not yet been established with God nor man. Though he, was, though he was born the son of God, no different than when you get saved. You don't get saved and go into servanthood. When you get saved... As John chapter 1 says, and to those that believed on him, to them gave he the power, the legal right to become the sons of birth of God. The sons of birth. The sons of birth. And increased, he increased in wisdom, which means he didn't have enough yet. He increased in stature or age. And in favor with God and man. Selah. When a person gets saved. I don't care how gift. Like I'm going to say it again. I don't care how gifted they are. I don't care how much you're moved in your mind and your emotions. I don't care how much knowledge they have. You don't go from being born to being anointed. Because the first thing you must learn is how to be a son, not even a servant. It is not the will of God. And the father said, go on and say it for people to get saved and then go to work in the church. That's not the will of God. Unless the Lord tells someone. Unless the Holy Spirit says, you see mother so-and-so, you see elder so-and-so, you see deacon so-and-so, I want you to tell them that I told you to help them with opening the church. I want you to tell them that I told you, but that has to be initiated by the Father. You don't go straight from sonship, you just get saved. You need to sit down somewhere and learn. What does it mean for me to be saved? Because as I said, most people are not discipled first. They're converted first. And then they get saved and they have no idea what it means. They don't know about the kingdom of men. They don't know about the kingdom of God. They don't know what it means to be. They don't know that the very Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of their spirit has set them apart from everything that they knew in the world. And immediately you are expected to walk away from everything unrighteous. Everything. The Holy Spirit is the reason why he's called the Holy Spirit is because 
He is the very, he carry, he's the very presence of God. And the very presence of God will not lead you to fornicate. The very presence of God will not tell you it's okay to continue to smoke a joint. The very presence of God on the inside of your spirit is going to convict you if you still cussing. The very spirit of God on the inside of your spirit is going to convict you. You need to forgive. The very spirit of God on the inside of your spirit will tell you you've been disrespectful all your life to your mother and your father. And I don't care what they did wrong. You better go apologize. The very spirit of God, according to Romans 8, is the spirit of sonship. When you get saved, the only thing you become is a son. You do not become anointed. You do not. No more than Jesus. He's the pattern. And God only gives dominion to sons. So let me digress and say this concerning the nation, the people of Israel. When God brought them out, they had the mind of a slave. They didn't know what it meant to be a son, except to their fathers. They had minds of a slave. They only knew the system and the government of Egypt and how it worked. So they were coming from a mindset of always expecting a handout. If I do the work, give me, give me, give me. Even though they were being abused and oppressed, they were dependent on another system that didn't require any character development. I'll put it that way. So what does God do? He sends a prophet who he's trained as a shepherd for 40 years named Moses and says, go get my son. And he brings his son through the blood of the lambs that were sacrificed, put on the doorpost, and bought them by the blood. He brings them through the water of the Red Sea, showing the blood the water. And then he brings them to Mount Sinai because they don't know who their spiritual father is. So God has Moses bring them to Mount Sinai so they can learn what it means to be the son of Abraham. Hence, spiritually, God saying, I just adopted you all. And I know right now the only thing you've had is circumcision for the past 430 years. That's all you know. Matter of fact, for the past 700 years, all you know is circumcision. All your people have known is circumcision. You've been in bondage for 430 years. You don't know anything else. But I'm bringing you to this mountain through the shepherd that I have set apart named Moses. And he's going to give you my word that you'll know how to conduct yourself as a nation and as sons. So the first commandment, besides the first four, of no idols, not bowing down yourself, not taking the Lord thy, the name thy God in vain, and, and honoring the Sabbath, the, the first commandment that God says is honor your mother, your father, and your mother. The first commandment, the first horizontal commandment is a commandment for sonship. It's a command for sonship. Okay? Okay. Because there are certain things that God is saying that my sons, male and female, have been asking me because they don't understand the process. You don't go from regeneration, you're getting saved, to authority in God. You don't have no authority yet. The only authority you have is to be a son. And all that that inheritance provides. And the first thing that you need to see about when you give your life to God is getting deliverance. And the renewing of your mind from the way that you were used to thinking and functioning and believing and responding and reacting, etc., 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 and behaving. Okay? Y'all follow me. Amen. This is good. Amen, Apostle. Appreciate you, son, so much. Appreciate you so much. Jesus says to Joseph and his mother, why is it that you were looking for me? Because Jesus thought, it's well, it's time for, it's, what else would there be? I've had my bar mitzvah, time to be about my father's business. I know that my father is God. Time to be about my father's business. So he goes, because I, I, I hear, I can see in the spirit. I, mean, I got to digress and prophesy what I see. 
I see in the spirit like a rewind of, of visions that some of you have had, positions you were given in ministry, positions you were given with people of God, and positions that you were given. And when you look back, you knew you weren't ready for it. But because it was affirming, and because you trusted the, the, the mind of those who were saved longer than you or knew the Bible more than you, even though the Holy Spirit was showing you back then, years ago, months ago, what, however long it was, you said, well, maybe they know better than they know better than I do. The Bible says in 1 John that the anointing who resides in you will teach you all things and you need not that any man should teach you. And what John was saying was this. John was saying, you don't ever need anybody to tell you what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. You don't need a prophet to tell you what God is saying to you. Now you may need a prophet to expound on what God has already told you. But no believer should be seeking a prophet to say, do you know what my gift is? Do you know what God is telling me to do? Do you know what how God is? But that's not the Bible. And this is what the meaning, write these scriptures down. This is the meaning of what Jesus said when he said, call no man in the earth your father, for you have one father which is in heaven. He was not saying that your, your father, your pops, or your papa is not your papa. He was saying there is no one in the earth that God has given exclusive uh, uh, authority over your development. There is no one. People in positions of spiritual leadership, whether they, you call them mother or father, their responsibility is to pray for you, cover you, and see according to the mind of God the direction that God has ordained for your life and instruct you according to that. Jesus said, call no man. Thank you, Danielle. Jesus said, call no man. D Danielle put the scripture. Call no man your father in the earth. That means, again, that the, God did not uh, ordain for spiritual development, for a man or woman to tell you, I know you think that's what the Lord wants you to do, but I'm telling you that's not it. Then, then pray for them and release them to get with God and say, well, I see why you would say that, but I would even suggest maybe you fast and seek the Lord a little longer, but you should be able to tell the person why they're not ready. Not just, no, it's not time yet. I don't believe that. That's witchcraft. That opens the doors for familiar spirits for you to look for signs and so-called confirmations that what you believe God is showing you is the truth. Jesus at 12 has had his bar mitzvah and he says, and he says, believe it or not, I'm almost done. I think. I don't know if I said that too too quick, Lord. I'm sorry. But I'm, 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 I'm getting to where God wants me to get to. So Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. <laughs> Matthew chapter 3. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments and I will, I will answer them live. For those that are watching on YouTube, you can also put questions in, in the comment section if you choose to. Um, and I will answer them there as well. Okay. Um, so I, I want to make that clear. I want to make sure the Lord wants disciples. He wants believers who are spiritually disciplined. Spiritually disciplined and understand that our processes are supposed to look just like Jesus's. 
Jesus was born the son of God. But Jesus was not born anointed. So when you get born from above or born again or saved, your identity is you're now a son of God. That's it, people, male and female. When you get saved, you're a son. That's it. Okay? And there are places in the scripture of feeding on the word like the, a sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Because when a baby is born, they don't know how to talk. You don't know how to talk as a believer. I don't care how nice you were. I don't care how separate. You may have been disciplined. You may have been like the beloved Dr. Antoinette Hewitt and, and brought up in the church and didn't party and didn't do none of that stuff. Didn't have no desire for the world. And from 12 years old, just desired the presence of God. Never desired the world. You may be like, like she was. And who God allowed her to re, be raised by, by spiritual, in the presence of spiritual mothers that would teach her how to discern what was the spirit of God and what was not the spirit of God. But she still was not saved and did not become a son of God until the Lord drew her the way he drew her. And she said, okay, it's my turn now to make this decision for myself. Okay. Romans again. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no one born with the presence of God. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. Now, John wasn't talking about being baptized in water. John was talking about being baptized in the Holy Ghost and with fire because John's consecration was still according to the law. It was still according to the Nazarite vow. He was separated from his mother's womb. He had interceded for years before Jesus came. But when he recognized Jesus by the Spirit, he recognized that this was the Son of God. Watch what he says in verse 15. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, meaning John, suffered him, which means he baptized him. And, when, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw... The Spirit of God, meaning John, descending like a dove and lighting upon Jesus, upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, not this is the Messiah. When Jesus came, finished his natural process, by now Joseph had died. Jesus is now 30 years old. It's in the book of Luke. Jesus is now 30 years old. The time has come for him to come to Jordan for his to for his, to him for him to be anointed by the prophet John. Jesus anointing was his baptism. Okay? That was his anointing. And 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 what I mean by that, that was his inauguration. That was the acknowledgement of Jesus making an open statement. He was not yet anointed, but what it was all in the Old Testament, this is kingdom, all prophets were sent to make a declaration of who was the king. So Jesus came to John and to his baptism, not because he was a sinner, not because he needed to repent, but to make an open statement. Through his baptism, I'm bringing a kingdom that is not of this world. But yet, Jesus is still not anointed. What did the voice from heaven say? This is my beloved son. Not the Messiah. So still, Jesus is not anointed. I hear that word. I hear the name Penelope again. Verse chapter 4. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness 
to be tempted of the devil. Jesus, the heavenly father, Jesus was born of the spirit. He had his bar mitzvah. He grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. He shows up 18 years later. 18 years later. 30 years later after his birth. Jesus has gone through a process of being submitted to elders of his community of honoring his surrogate father, Joseph, until his death and honoring his mother and carrying on the business of the carpentry shop. Right? He knows he's the son of God. He knows what his assignment is, but he also knows the father's not ready for me yet. So he comes under the, the, the protection of Joseph and Mary. Okay. Jesus, the father says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But Jesus didn't start a ministry, y'all. So verse two, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, just like Satan, your identity has been confirmed by God. And he comes to make you prove it by getting out of the will of God. So Satan, you can read that on your own. Tempts Jesus. Well, he don't really tempt him. Jesus just has to go through the process. Jesus is affirmed by his heavenly father. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And the spirit of God. The spirit led him to a location to have to endure being tried in his humanity. He's led. How many of us can do that? Okay. He's affirmed by the father, but yet the father sends him. To be tried. Luke 4, please. Luke chapter 4. Because Luke 4 mentions this. Luke 4. Luke 4. Okay, Luke 4, and the timing of the Son, Jesus. Verse 16, Luke 4, 16. And he came to Nazareth. This was after he finished the 40 days and 40 nights of being tried. Verse 16, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was... He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Now, what that means and looks like is this. When you went into the synagogue, the, the, the scriptures, like, here's a Bible, okay? Here's my Bible. There was no Bible. There were scriptures. And the scriptures were kept in a sacred and closed compartment. And the only ones that were allowed to touch the Holy Scriptures were those that were set apart as rabbis and priests that were called to protect the Holy Scriptures. So you just didn't, for Jesus to stand up to read, Jesus came after his 40 days and 40 nights into the temple. He went back home where he was raised. He wasn't in Jerusalem. He was in Nazareth. And he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He was on, on time and stood up to read. And when you would read the scriptures, 
you would read wherever whatever scripture was appointed for the for the people for that day. So you just didn't read whatever you wanted to read. Not even the rabbi chose. The scriptures themselves, even to this day, there's a scripture assigned for the Jews for every day. Jesus goes into the synagogue on the day when the scriptures had were had landed on Isaiah which prophesied of Jesus so Jesus had to be Jesus now had fasted and been synchronized with heaven he showed up to be baptized but now he was synchronized with heaven to show up in the synagogue on the day when the scriptures would prophesy and there was delivered unto him in verse 17 of Luke 4, the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. Jesus was now anointed to preach the gospel to the poor, he hath sent me, apostolos, he hath sent me, which means that Jesus knew what he was, he was getting to the purpose for which God, the Father, had sent him to the earth. And now Jesus was about to get occupied with his assignment because he now had revelation of his assignment because he was anointed. So if you have to ask, do you know what my assignment is? Do you know what God has called me to do? I wonder what God has called me to do. Then you're not anointed. You're not anointed yet. If you have to ask, then you're not anointed. Because when you finish the process that God has ordained for you as a son, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you and the Holy Spirit will send a confirming word through someone else more mature than you. Not your peers, not your prayer partner, not your buddy. He will send an authority in the kingdom of God to say, the Lord showed me this is who you are. If you still have to ask what God has called you to do, you're not anointed. Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed. Because, because, because when you are anointed, the anointing has a purpose. So Jesus was able to say to the Canaanite woman, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel because he knew what his anointing was for. Come on, this is helping a whole lot of folks and strengthening some leaders. And for, for some of you who like, I knew I wasn't crazy. I knew when I was younger, I knew when I would see things and I'm like, I don't care what everybody's saying, they're not anointed. No, you wasn't crazy. It was the Holy Spirit showing you, that's not my anointing. They got a gift, but they haven't been through a process. Verse 18. He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me. This is part. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He anointed him to preach. He sent him to heal. He sent him to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He was anointed to preach the gospel, and he was sent to heal, to heal the brokenhearted. What did he send you for? That's for those saying, I believe God has called me to the apostolic. Then there is going to come a process to where the Lord is going to say, this is what the anointing is for, and you are to stick to that anointing. 
Don't try to do anything outside of what I processed you for. Don't try to touch anything in the kingdom that I have not sent you to do. And we have a lot of that in the church and in Christendom. And because people have a gift of influence or a gift of leadership, they've done some studying and done some reading and, and have, have gathered followers to teachings and God didn't send them to teach. Verse 20, and he closed the book and gave it to the minister and sat down. That means he gave it to the one who had oversight of the scriptures. Jesus ju just didn't watch, come up into, excuse me, into the synagogue and grab the scriptures. They had to be given to him. Jesus understood protocol. And it was his turn to stand up in the synagogue to read. And when it was given to him, he didn't pick his own scripture. He picked the one that the father gave him. When the minister gave it to him, it was the book of Isaiah. Because each, each book had a separate scroll, right? There were scrolls for the whole Old Testament known as the scriptures. And Jesus was given Isaiah and he knew he was anointed. And it was time for him to make a declaration that this is the purpose that the Father has sent me. Verse 21, and he began to say unto them, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And he told them then, over 2,000 years ago, this that Isaiah prophesied has been fulfilled. I'm here. And then it began. Jesus went from his identity. When you get born again or saved, you have an identity. That's it. The gifts are without repentance. God is never sorry that you have them. But you are not yet anointed. So Jesus does three and a half years of his assignment and he finishes it at Golgotha. Matter of fact, he finishes it after being buried and risen again. So I want to look at Philippians and I am closing. God only gives dominion to sons. So you can be saved and question your identity. God will send, understand this, God will make sure that he gives you when you seek him and when you posture yourself as a son, he will make sure that you have leaders that can affirm you in your new identity as a son. If you're looking for the Lord to confirm anything that you're not, you will miss those that the Lord has appointed to help you grow. The ones that the Lord the ones that the Lord appointed to protect the child Jesus and watch him grow until he would make it to the Jordan was Joseph and Mary. And when Joseph finished his assignment, he died. When Joseph finished making sure that Jesus made it to his 30th with the understanding of who he was from the tribe of Judah, etc., Joseph died, and it was now for Jesus to understand his identity now from heaven, not just as a Jew. So for all of us who are African, who are African and in America, who are, as it were, Native American, who are European, who are Asian, South Asian, Australian, whatever ethnicity and race you are that's what you're born with naturally when you are born from above your identity is a son of God your identity in Christ is not I am not an African in Christ I am a son of God and the pattern is the pattern of Jesus and it is for me to, in the spirit, it's your spiritual identity. Did the Lord choose for me to be born in America? 
who came through the loins of my fathers from Africa and be born in America, raised in Philadelphia, born in Kansas, raised in Philadelphia, finish being being raised and, and understanding community, learning community in New Jersey to come into the Air Force and learn government so that he might reveal the kingdom to me while I was serving the United States government. But when the time came while I was serving the United States government, the Holy Spirit drew me according to John 6, 44 and said, now is the time for that in which you were raised in in Philadelphia to become your spiritual identity as a son. And the Lord took me through a process of deliverance and gave me a spiritual mother in the person of, of mom, Joyce Smith, minister Joyce Smith to protect me as a prophet because I knew I was a prophet four months after I got saved. I knew I'd known I was a prophet since the eighties, but I wasn't anointed yet to speak for God because I hadn't finished going through the process of my identity as a son. And the Lord gave me mom and dad Smith, Christina, Flatina, as a family to teach me how to be a son. And for mom to tell me, I know you're a prophet, but there's a certain way you got to speak to God's people. I know you're a prophet, but I, I, be, I was very protective of my relationship with the Lord. And anytime somebody, mom, would tell me something that I felt contradicted my identity as a prophet, I would get hostile because, because of abandonments from the past, I would feel like she was trying to take my identity, which I thought was a prophet. And, the, and, and, and mom would tell me, she said, I need God to show you how much I love you. Because I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to protect you because you're not just another Christian. You are a prophet of God and there's a certain way you need to walk. And I didn't want to hear it. Because I had identity I had an identity crisis. I was an independent woman who served in the government and could accomplish anything she put her heart to. But I rejected instruction. Because I didn't understand my identity as a son. And in the church, in the 90s, there were those who wanted to exploit my gift as a youth pastor and all of that and, and prophetic here and there because I wasn't walking as a prophet and wanted to exploit my influence. And mom Joyce would say, you're not ready for that yet. Mom Joyce said, you need to watch out for these people. They don't have your best interests at heart. And I accused her. I would accuse her of trying to keep me from having other relationships besides her and the family. Because I didn't know what, I didn't understand what real family was. And I gave Mom Joyce such a hard time that the Lord told Mom, you can let her go if you want to. You can release her to me if you want to. You don't have to endure this anymore. Because through my hurt, it was accusation after accusation after accusation. And Mom Joyce told the Lord, I'll stick it out. And it was her love. It was the love of a real mother in Zion who prayed for me, who watched over for me, who opened her home to me. That's a whole nother testimony. Who opened her their first home to me after her husband retired out of the Air Force and gave me my own Elisha living quarters. And because I was independent and I knew I could do it myself, I couldn't see that the only motive was love. And if it wasn't for Mom Joyce, Enduring what she endured, Minister Joyce Smith, if it wasn't for her endurance, I would not be sitting before you today. And she got me to the place to where the Lord could remove me from California, send me to Georgia, and, and tell me by the year 2000, you've become more than a prophet, you've become a daughter. And he said, now I'm going to show you according to the scripture what sonship looks like. And you're going to be able to sit and tell my people 
that I don't give inheritance and authority to anointed men and women of God. I give authority to sons. Thank you, Mom. I was able to tell that this time, Mom, without crying. Because it's, 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 it's not that it doesn't bring tears. It's so much strength. Because I know that there are other sons who need to hear it. When you have a heart of a son, that's Joy Smith with the heart right there. That's Mom. When you have the heart of a son, God will show you who he's given you that you can trust to receive instruction, correction, and guidance that you might be led into your purpose and destiny. Philippians chapter 2, talking about Jesus, who being in the form of verse 6, verse 6 of Philippians 2, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself. Jesus knew he was the son of God and he did not walk around like it. He walked around with the responsibility of what it mean in his character and making sure that his representation resembled the father. It is our responsibility not to make sure that people see who we are and see how anointed we are and how much Bible knowledge we are and how many followers we got. It's for people to see the image of the Father. Jesus thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He made himself of no reputation and took upon, the son took upon him the form of a servant. A son who's really a son has no problem serving others that they might be made closer to the Father. And was made in the likeness of men. Verse 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Sons have no problem humbling themselves even when they are misunderstood. That's a real son. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Real sons are not trying to make sure that people see their identity, see their anointing. That's why in Galatians, Paul speaks of the fruit of the spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the goodness, the meekness, the long-suffering, the temperance, the faith, and the peace says you're a son. It says the fruit of the Spirit, not the function of, your, of God's anointing. Because let me say this. God can anoint you for a purpose, but it doesn't make you anointed. I'm going to say that again. God can anoint you for a moment because you're submitted and you still not complete a process. And then when you look for the anointing to destroy yokes in your life or your family's life, it doesn't show up because you haven't finished a process. So the Lord, you can fast for, let's say the Lord says fast for five days. You fast for five days. And the Lord has the intention of increasing incre his presence coming forth through you, getting your flesh out of the way for five days, coming through, going into the presence of people or what have you, and you pray for the sick and they get healed and I prayed for them and they had COVID and the symptoms went away and they had a test that was positive and in three days the test came back negative. Okay. But did you yourself finish and complete a process ordained by God to where when you show up, the anointing is always there and he can trust you of when to use it? Okay? Jesus knew what he was anointed for. 
So there are even momentary anointings because the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit who is the anointing, the Christos. And you get oiled because you set yourself apart for a little bit. And the presence of God comes upon you strongly and you get something accomplished. Guess what? That was the same thing that happened to John the Baptist. John the Baptist was baptized from his mother's womb. He stayed in his consecration. For the years he stayed in his consecration. He identifies the Christ. But guess what? Now there's no need for him to be anointed because now he's in prison. Well, he don't need to be an, an, an anointed anymore. So now the anointing is off of him and he sends messengers to Jesus to say, are you the one or did I miss it? Because the purpose for the anointing is now completed. And now it's time for John's head to be removed so, so that Jesus, the focus can be on Jesus. So again, the Lord can anoint you for a season. But your submission to his process determines whether or not the anointing will always show up when the Lord sends you to accomplish something. The Lord said some, some of us need to go back to the drawing board. I'm almost done. Verse 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God, wherefore God, talking about the Father, also hath highly exalted him. Jesus didn't exalt himself. God hath highly exalted him and given, given, given him a name which is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory, not of Jesus, to God the Father. Jesus had an identity. He came to the Jordan. That identity was confirmed through an anointed prophet, which caused Jesus' baptism to be a declaration that the kingdom he was bringing was not of this world. John's anointing ceases. He goes to prison. Jesus has gone through a process in Luke 4 and been anointed. Matthew 28. Jesus has gone through a process and is now anointed and finishes three and a half years in his ultimate assignment of the cross. Taking the, the flesh to the cross so that anyone who receives his sacrifice of his shed blood would be as if you died on the cross. And the spirit that you would receive would be the power of the Christ to accomplish anything that the Holy Spirit reveals that the Father wants to accomplish in your life, in your lives. Matthew 28. And in this, the Lord, amen, amen. You hear the Lord loud and clear, amen. Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus is speaking after his resurrection and before his ascension to heaven. And verse 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power, legal authority, that power is exousia. All power, I now, the, the legal authority, both in heaven and in earth, has been given. Why in heaven and in earth? Because until, I'm going to say this slow. Jesus said, all, all power has been given to me, both in heaven and in earth. It was not given when Jesus was born. He did not have all power in the earth. That's why when he was led of the Spirit 
for 40 days to be tempted of the devil. The devil offered him the kingdoms of the world because they were Satan's to give. Because they were given to Satan by Adam. And they were affirmed to Satan when Israel as a nation did not submit as a son. You can be able to rewind this. Because I mentioned Israel being a son from Exodus 3. Satan says to Jesus in Luke 4 and in Matthew 4. If you fall down and worship me, I will give you the, the, the kingdoms of this world. All of which you see will be yours. And basically what he showed him was Rome's territory. Who was the ruler of the world. Jesus made a decision as a son about his worship. And his service. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, King James. And him only shalt thou serve. Jesus declared who he would worship alone and who he would serve alone. I will serve no other God. I will worship no other God. It is written. Worship the Lord thy God and him only shall you serve. So Jesus, in the Mount of Temptation, did not have authority in the earth. It was not until he took the power of the flesh and crucified it on the cross. He didn't just die on the cross. Let me make this announcement. Jesus himself did not just die on the cross for anyone in the future from, from the day of Pentecost on, who would receive the blood sacrifice of Jesus, that meant you died too. Read Romans 6. When you get saved, you are saying, I am ready to declare myself dead to the old me. Say that again. When you get saved, you are saying, I accept the truth that Jesus killed my flesh and all its iniquities and all its transgressions and all its sins and he took my flesh with him to the cross. And because I have accepted his blood sacrifice, I am declaring my own self dead. Now, Lord, whose instruction and how do I learn how to walk according to my new spirit according to the spiritual life that you've just given me Jesus said all power is given legal right and that was because he died that's because he he was buried and he rose again after three days after three days after three days after three days and three nights After three days and three nights, Jesus got up. And when he got up, hey, Dr. Gaddis, when he got up, before, when he got up, before that, he went to hell and told Satan, it's over. You no longer have the power over death. You no longer can take anybody out in anyone who chooses to accept me in my name. They have all power over you in my character. As they submit as sons to the same pattern that I have demonstrated and submitted to the Father in my death, anyone who accepts me does no longer is subject to your authority. All power was given to Jesus. And because he had the legal authority, he was able to tell his disciples, now you go and teach all nations. In other words, make disciples throughout this whole earth. And so... He sent the apostles the same way the Father sent him. Jesus sent 
those who follow Jesus and said, now you make disciples so that you can send them to do what you were empowered to do. You send them so that they can be empowered by my spirit. Whoever believes and is baptized, the same shall be saved. You do what I did. There are those that are grace to follow Jesus. I was one. To follow Jesus, meaning to follow his spirit without anyone's help. The Lord gave me mom Joyce to posture my heart in sonship. But everything that I was given was given from the Lord teaching me and from leading by the Holy Spirit to those whose voices I heard in their consecration. And the Lord said, now you hear that revelation? Now this is how I want you to make disciples with that revelation. Okay? The process, the process of God is that those who choose, who accept the drawing of the Holy Spirit and come into sonship, the Lord's first focus is that you understand your identity, not your gift, not your calling, not your assignment, your identity. What does it look like, according to the pattern of Jesus, to be a son? And then the scriptures in the, Old Test in the New Testament show us more precisely what does that look like to be a son? The Lord, the Heavenly Father, chooses the process for those that he has ordained to be anointed. For those he's ordained to be anointed. Because the reality is, the Holy Spirit himself is the anointing. But God didn't call, call everybody to be anointed. He did not. God did not call, call and did not, has not ordained. Let me say this. Some people that have become sons of God, God has instructed them to open a barbershop. You don't need an anointing for that. You don't need an anointing. You need your identity as a son. The Lord says, go into this particular neighborhood, open a barbershop. And this is how I want the barbershop to be. I want you to give anyone that's over 55 years old free haircuts. Any, any man that comes in there that needs barbering, you're going to give them and you're going to teach the young men that come in. They're going to see that you don't charge them anything. You're going to make disciples and you're going to become a spiritual father with a barbershop. And so anyone over 55 years old, sir, may, may I ask you how old you are? I'm 58 years old. Anytime you come in here, sir, if you like my barbering, your haircut, your beard, tr trimming is free. Are you serious? Yes, sir. Because God told me to open this barbershop and teach young men how to respect their elders. Because he wants to restore sonship to the neighborhood. You don't need an anointing for that. Okay? So you have a lot of people who God has called to other areas in life and in community, in government, in arts, whatever it could be. Right? And God has called you to affect lives by being a son and then showing you, okay, this is your assignment. This is your assignment. I want you to go to school, I want you to go to college, and I want you to work in the community. But you don't need to be anointed for that. Now, you may go through a process of learning some things so that my presence becomes more prevalent. But you don't, I'm not calling you to lay hands on the sick. Notice when we read in Luke 4, Jesus said, he has anointed me to preach the gospel. He has sent me to heal. To bind up, to set at liberty those that are bruised, to preach, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus knew what his anointing was for. 
And there were times when Jesus was in the multitudes where he prayed, he healed everybody, the Bible says. But then in John 5, he goes to a pool of a multitude of sick folk, heals one man. One man. And then he leaves. When Jesus raised John Lazarus from the dead, he didn't do it with an anointing. The anointing opened blind eyes. The anointing cured the lame. But it was with authority that he rose the dead. That's authority. He came showing that he had all authority over death and giving them an example so that they would rem remember later on that if you believe on me, you shall never die. And waited until Lazarus was dead four days. That wasn't anointing. When he rose Lazarus, that was authority. He was giving a precursor to what it would look like. To the father giving him authority. The process for those that are saved is from sonship, from identity. From identity. The identity of sonship. Then process to servant. To where God will give you authority. There are many that God has called to walk in an anointing. For those that God has called to walk in an anointing. That requires a process preordained and pre prescribed by God. That when that process is completed. The anointing is evident. Because it destroys yokes of bondage. Many, most of you don't know me. But you know that when I speak or when you listen to the podcast, whatever it is, for those that don't know, I have a podcast on charismapodcastnetwork.com called Kingdom Chronicles. It's also on Apple and Spotify. And Amazon. I've been doing these podcasts for the past six months but you know when you listen to the podcast you feel the presence of God that you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit that's an anointing that's anointing there are those that can testify that when you have sown your, of your natural resources and given to Dr. Brett A. Griffin that doors have opened. It could be land. It could be employment. It could be changing employment to where you're working without a whole bunch of sweat and worry and toil and what you've asked for. That's authority. And that authority comes from the multitude of covenants because nothing I have is my own. I've been full-time to the Lord for 28 years because I made a covenant with him. And he told me 28, almost 29 years ago, you shall not work for anyone else except me. I am retiring you. Because I made a covenant with God by sacrifice. That's in the scripture and song. I made a covenant with God that if you get me out of debt, that was 1989, I'll do whatever you tell me to do with my money. I was in the Air Force. And when he got me out of debt, and when it was through favor, I asked him what to do. And he said, sow into my kingdom and I'll take care of you the rest of your life. And for four years, the last four years in the Air Force, I gave God my paycheck. And I only kept what he told me I could keep. That was the beginning of my authority that when people sow and look for demonstration and clarity and direction from God... If your heart is toward following God as a son, he will give it to you. And he will give you word and clarity. And according to Joshua 1 and 8, you will make your way prosperous. My authority comes from a covenant that I still keep. That I still keep. I do whatever he tells me to do with my resources. 
whatever he tells me to do. I've given away four cars. That's why the testimony of the Audi that I received a year and a half ago, and that testimony, and when the man of God said, who I was consulting to as a contractor, the Lord told me to give you this car. I don't know why I said I do, because I was still running from hurts. And he said, I bought this car as a contractor so that I could be riding in something beside my truck when I'm not working. And God told me to give it to you because of the increase of my business and my work without sweat since listening to your counsel and having you a retainer. And I said, God, having her on retainer is not enough. What else can I do? I have never had this much peace in my life. And I began to lead him according to kingdom principles as a businessman. Because he didn't need to be anointed to work for the government as a marine uh, 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 technician, etc. And all of what he knows how to do, electrician, lay floor, all of it. He was taught by his grandfather. That wasn't an anointing. That was a skill set he was given at 12 years old. And he's, a, he's an elder gentleman. He's around my age. He's maybe a year older. I'm 56. Okay. He's older than I am. And at this time in his life, he said, I have never had this much peace. And God told me to give you this vehicle. And he got some persecution for it. He got a little bit. And I said, I understand why. I said, you don't know my journey, but the Lord does. And the Lord wants it to be seen what God has given me. And because you said God told you to give it to me, it's given to me by God. It's just released at your hand. That's authority. That's authority. To where when I would pray for him and prophesy to him, it would move hell and invite heaven to where he would have clarity for direction of wherever he was to serve all over this country and serving the government. As a civilian working for the government, Department of Defense, the Lord opened the government because I was speaking to him from the government of God. And we met by divine orchestration. The kingdom of God is real. God sent his son and gave his son that whoever would choose to be a son by accepting the blood sacrifice of the Lord Jesus might become sons, gain a new identity, begin a transformation that would lead you into inheritance that would bring you to a place of authority that what you say if you doubt not in your heart, would be accomplished. What you say. Did I see Mom Vivian? I think I saw her name come up. If y'all see Vivian Garnier, that is the mother, a mother that God gave me when I was 15 years old, who gave me the space to be independent until I would go into the Air Force. I am forever grateful. That was, that was Vivian Garnier before I met Mom Joyce. The Lord was divinely orchestrating my life. And I made an agreement with Mom Vivian and she gave me space to be independent of both parents. I love you forever for that, Mom Vivian. I appreciate you. Father, thank you for this evening and for the word, and for those that will hear the word. Thank you for those that will sow, for those on YouTube. If you choose to sow, and Cash App is dollar sign, lowercase k, S is in Sam, Q-U-A-R. I'm also on Venmo, Dr. Brett A. Griffin. And you can also, if you choose to sow through PayPal at Harvest 2100, author, A-U-T-H-O-R-B, griffin at gmail.com for those that choose to sow through YouTube. Thank you, Father, for the word for those that choose to sow. You didn't send me here that I may be served, but that I may serve with the word and understanding of sonship, that in this coming of 2022, we would be postured as sons 
to receive authority by walking in your process and your ordained process for our lives. Thank you for the hearers. Thank you for this word falling on good ground in these winter months that it may be, it may be, it be fertilized through good soil and bring forth fruit in this coming harvest season come April. Thank you, Lord God, for the mothers. Thank you for blessing the apostles and the prophets that are on right now and those that were here. Thank you for the mothers you gave me in my life. And in particular, Mom Vivian Garnier and Mother Joyce Smith. Thank you, and I speak blessings upon them. Honor and increase be upon them. Rest and their latter years be better than their former in the name of Jesus. I send blessings to you all for this, for this week and um, a most blessed and happy new year to you. You're welcome, Apostle Hawker. Thank you to those that I usually meet with on Wednesdays who gladly, when I said I need to meet me on, 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 on live, um, thank you for graciously agreeing to that. I appreciate that. I meet you all next time. And um, unless the Lord chooses in the next few days, I'll see you next year. Amen. So blessings to you. Blessings to you, uh, Miss Jerry. Blessings to you, Shekinah. Blessings, Apostle Ayala. Te quiero. <laughs> Te quiero. Amen. Blessed sleep to you all. Thank you. Receive that. Receive that. Receive that. Until next time, um, for those that will choose to sow, I will be making declarations over your seed and especially for what's coming in into 2022. I pray this time has been a blessing to you all. Blessings to you. Appreciate you, Prophet Hughes. <laughs> Love you. Blessings to you. And to Ziada. Amen. Amen. I'm sure she's getting big. I've seen pictures. She's beautiful. Bless you, Auntie. That's my Auntie, Bambi Gaddis, South Carolina. Love you. Love you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Amen. Bye-bye, everybody.